Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here with you once again. It's gorgeous outside other than it being hot. <laughs> That's our time of the year for Texas, though. I'm looking forward to the fall. I was telling Judy the other day, you know, it's only a month before we leave. And she said, stop telling me that. It's, we're not ready. We've got things to do. But the feast is going to be upon us very soon. We already have our plans made and travel plans. Hopefully, the COVID uh, debacle won't interfere with some of our flights. You know, what we've noticed this year is that the airline industry is a fluid. They are sending us uh, text almost every day, every other day, of a flight that's been changed. Some of it's by minutes, some of it's, you know, uh, by several minutes. The flight number will be changed. It's almost like it's all in a computer and it's adjusting to you know, the the industry out there, and, and some flights are far more difficult to get now, but um, we'll see how that goes. I hope that all goes well. I've never missed a sermon at one of the feast sites that I was traveling to, and I'm only going to three this year, so I hope that everything goes really well, and I hope you have plans to be there as well. I hope your, your plans are not uh, hindered by any means. Who is God? You ever had a little child ask you that? Well, mom and dad, who who is God? What is God? You know, it's a difficult question. If you get hit from, you know, without any planning ahead of time, you know, you just get hit blindsided by that question. And believe it or not, most parents aren't really prepared to answer such a question that may seem like a simple question. And they'll usually fumble around and say something, well, he is, he, God is invisible and he's great and he's out there somewhere and we can't see him and no, we can't talk to him. How do you answer that question, who is God? How can we claim to be godly people, Christians, living a godly life if we don't know who God is? I mean, isn't that the focus, the center of everything we do here? God. How can we pray to God if we don't know who he is? And how can we praise him or worship him if we just have this sort of a foggy, mystical idea of who God is out there? Can a simple person describe who God is anyway? You remember Job said, can you by searching find out God? And Job in another place said, we can neither, neither can the number of his years be searched out. God, I'd like to begin by saying God is not, and I'm going to mention a few here. Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, verse 28. Here the Moses was warning the nation of Israel, and of course he was warning them against idolatry even before they actually did go out and commit idolatry with these pagan gods or whatever it was. And down in verse 28, he says, and, you know, he told them that if, if they did commit idolatry, he was going to scatter them to all the nations, and you shall be uh, left few in number among the heathen, whether the Lord shall lead you. In other words, I'm going to drive you into these foreign lands. And there you shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. How would you like to be sent away captive into a foreign land and they worship some pagan wooden idol there and they forced you to bow down and worship it? I mean, that's kind of the impression that I get when I read that scripture. In Psalm 135, it says, The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. So we have wood and stone and silver and gold, all of these. Isaiah 66, I would like to turn there. Just quoted that last one to you here. Isaiah 66, the very first uh, verse here, it says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. And of course he asks, Where is the house that you will build unto me? God does dwell out there somewhere. He actually is not something imaginary. He is not a God of stone or wood or silver or gold. But he is out there 
in Acts, the 17th chapter, I want to go there and look at what the Apostle Paul said about this, Acts 17. And I'll apologize to you ahead of time. I'm kind of bouncing around today because i got several aspects of this subject that I wanted to cover. Acts 17 chapter, down in verse 24, he says, he was there on Mars Hill. He's in a pagan society in a pagan nation, and he's standing there, and he says, I see that you have this, script, this, this inscription to the unknown God. He said, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. You know, and he didn't call them a bunch of ignorant heathens. He'd have been thrown off a cliff or stoned to death. But he was telling them that you, you know, without understanding that you you ignorantly, and, and that's probably a little more harsher, a lot harsher word than he used um, by using that word ignorantly. He probably didn't use that word actually. He said, I de- him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. Now I've seen a lot of churches where people believe that God is here. You know, God is in this building, this physical building, and or maybe over in St. Peter's Basilica, which has been spending money on that building for literally centuries. It has some of the finest uh, artwork, marble, floors, walls, ceiling. It has a... You look up and see the ceiling of that place, and there is not... There's nothing that's out of place. There's not any imperfections that you can see in the artistry and the tapestry and all of the uh, stone and uh, gold that's in that building. And everywhere you look, there is fine art that you can't even begin to imagine. And they believe that God dwells there. God is in that place. God does not reside in a building. He's not wood and stone and silver. And even though he may seem far away and invisible and unapproachable, look what he says. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though God needs anything. And a lot of people think that you have to worship God with our hands. Either we, gotta, we have to build something that God will uh, uh, you know, be impressed with or we actually have to use our hands in a certain way. And we've got to hold them up or do, do something with our hands in order for God to hear us. As though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. We should never forget that. And he's made of one blood all nations. Every nation is, you know, descendants from Noah, I guess. Noah's family and eventually all the way back to Adam and Eve. To dwell on all the face of the earth and he's determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if happily they may feel after him and find him, though he be not very far from every one of us. That is, that is an amazing scripture to me to think that this all-powerful creator, awesome God that's out there somewhere is not very far from either one of us. You know, the atheists don't believe, they don't believe in God. They, they just reject the idea that there is a God. The Bible tells us the, in Psalms that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And in Romans, the first chapter, I don't have to read that to this audience here, where he states, Paul writing to the Roman, the pagan Roman society there, that the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen. That the evidence is there in creation. I am always fascinated when I see a new creature or see a new plant or a new flower or see a beautiful sunrise or a sunset and I acknowledge that God did that. Or I see these beautiful mountain scenes or a, or a, a river up in the mountains and, and see fish or see some documentary of, in, on a nature channel maybe of some of the animals that, and their characteristics and how a herd of, uh, you know, I saw the other day a herd of giraffes running all together, you know, dozens of them. And it was, and uh, there was this, uh, I forget what they call it, a uh, uh, a herd maybe of dolphins 
uh, that was outrunning these ships. And I'm talking two or three hundred of them jumping up out of the water. And it was so fascinating to see them all together running like a, like a herd of uh, cattle or, you know, horses or something. It, it is amazing every time we look at creation, what we learn. And, and, and the f- deeper we dig, we find out more amazing characteristics and fascinating things about the plants and the animal, animal kingdom. In Galatians, the third chapter, he he tells those pagans in in the Galatian area there, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. They thought they were serving God, but they were worshiping someone who is pagan. How How then do you describe God? First, God is not a human. We know that. He is spirit. In John, the fourth chapter... Let's go there, John, the fourth chapter. We, we have to read this. John 4, down in verse 24, Jesus, in his own words, said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You can't just have God over here in your little corner, and I'll worship God how I want to. We must worship God in spirit, As he says, we must have God's Holy Spirit within us in order to worship God. And secondly, it must be in truth, not how we decide, but how God tells us that we are to worship him. As I've always said, Mr. Armstrong made this clear years and years ago. It's not, you know, it's not when or where or how or who, it's whether we're going to worship God. That's the only question that we have to answer. Because God already tells us how and where and when and why. God is a spirit and you cannot worship God God without God's spirit within you. He is not flesh and blood. And he's not physical but a spirit. And you know, this is sometimes a little difficult to understand uh, especially a young describing this to a young child, but even grown-ups don't understand this. You remember Nicodemus in John the third chapter? We can go back one one page here. John the third chapter, Jesus tells him that except a man be born again, he cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But then he goes on to say that God is, you know, that which is born of flesh is flesh. Human beings, dogs, those dolphins I described, those giraffe, they're all flesh. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. And then he goes on to describe what a spirit being is. He said, you know how the wind blows through the trees and, and you, you hear it you hear it coming and you see it go by. You see the wind blowing through the leaves. But you don't know where it came from or where it goes. It's invisible. And then he says something very interesting. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. A lot of uh, confusion about that verse. People think that they are born of the Spirit. When it actually tells us that if you're born of the Spirit, you are not a flesh and blood, but you are invisible like the wind. And a lot of people will argue about that. And they'll say, oh, no, I was born of the Spirit. You know, I, I uh, was saved when I was 12 years old or 8 years old. You know, and so I, am, uh, I was born of the Spirit. And that's actually a contradiction in terms here. If, you read, if you're going to be truthful with the Bible and what it, what it tells us about what being born of the Spirit is. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. One can begin to understand God by using the things that are made, as we, as we read in, in uh, Romans, the first chapter. In Psalm 19, I want to go back to what David wrote. Psalm 19 He tried with the best of his ability to describe God. And that's an altogether difficult task, as I said. Psalm 19 and verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. I quickly jotted down a few statistics here right before while I was listening to Mark in his update that um, in our solar system, the planet that they now say is not a planet, although for 30 years of my life it was a planet, you know, now it's not a planet, was 
it has a sort of an elliptical uh, path that goes around the sun within our solar system. It's the farthest, what we used to call the farthest planet from the sun within our solar system. When we are on opposite sides of the sun, we are 4.2 billion miles away from that planet. That is, that's the size and scope of just our solar system that we have. Uh, our nearest star, besides the sun, the nearest star, if we were to leave our solar system, is four light years away. And that sounds, oh, that's not very far. Well, that's traveling at 186,000 miles per second for four solid years. I think it's 4.2 solid years. And when you write that number out, it's one with about 20 zeros in miles. It, it blows your mind. It just blows your mind. When you look up and you see those, star, those brightest stars that are closest to us, it would take you four light years, which is impossible for human beings to travel. The Milky Way, and if you look out at night, sometimes you can see the residue of the Milky Way. It looks like a foggy, cloudy uh, mist of stars, especially like some of the places we went out in West out west in Colorado, we pulled over, Judy and I did one night. It was pitch black, dark. We were out in the middle. We couldn't even see the lights of any town, and we wanted to pull off. And we got out of the car, and we were a little scared because we were out in the middle of nowhere, and there could have been mountain lions or whatever. But we wanted to turn the lights off in the car and look up. And there it was, the Milky Way Galaxy. That's 100,000 light years across. Our galaxy, the only one that we live in, that we dwell in, that we exist in. And we know that there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands and even millions of galaxies out there. The nearest, the closest galaxy to us is 2.5 million light years away. And, and again, my mind, I understand it. My mind goes tilt, too. It's, it means nothing to me. You know, when I go past about 100,000 miles, which is about the amount of miles I put on a car in, in a couple of years because I do a lot of driving, anything beyond that is, is almost beyond my realm of understanding. Maybe the Earth, 25,000 miles in circumference, in, in circumference. And that even that is so hard to put in relative terms because when you get on a plane and you fly for nine or ten hours, you think, surely we should have gone around the earth by now, but you're still only a third of the way around. You know, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. The heavens declare his glory. They show us how big and awesome and powerful is God. But he, he can also be found in the most minute circumstances you know, and I use this term here because we think of God as being big and awesome and powerful. But then when you look at what Jesus said, that he said not even a sparrow falls to the ground without his knowledge. And the very hair of your head is numbered. So he takes care of big things, but he also considers things that may not be big to us, but they are significant to him. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, when you look at your body, your ability to read and to paint, to, to fly an airplane, uh, to drive a car, to shop, to, to make flowers arrangements, or whatever you might do to sew, to, to think, to you know, calculate and work out problems that man has been able to do. And you look at your body and how it's Design. You know, your elbow turns just right when you're trying to pick up a, a hammer. You know, I watch these guys at work and I'm thinking, you know, the human body is so agile and it's got quick reflexes too. You know, like someone will drop something, you'll see a guy jump straight backwards and whew, boy, he almost got hit. Or a car will zoom by and someone will jump out of the way, even tra passing trains. I've seen people do that. And they look up and they see a train on a railroad and they jump out of the way and it scares me half to death because I hate to see a human being get hurt. It hurts me in, down in my guts. I can't stand to see a human hurt in any way. And there's a lot of videos out there of people getting hurt. I can't watch them. It, it, it hurts me too much. 
I have too much sympathy for a human being in pain to, to watch that. Uh, he says, I am fearfully and wonder, wonderfully made. God can display his awesome power in the lightning in the thunder, like he did on Mount Sinai, and all the people fled because they were terribly afraid. This week, we had these bubble-up thunderstorms here in East Texas. It seems like once a week we're having these storms. I got out to open a gate down here in Mount Enterprise, Texas, and a bolt of lightning struck very close to where I was standing. I had my little umbrella, and I got out. Judy said, you want an umbrella? And I said, I'll take one with me today because it looks like it's going to rain. And I had my little umbrella. I got out of the truck, and I went over to unlock the gate, you know, and do the gate. And kaboom, I dropped that umbrella and ran and jumped back in the truck. You talk about get your attention now. That power, that force. One day this week, Judy came in. I was sitting in my study, and she sat on the little stool by the back door where I usually get up, get up in the morning and put my boots on as I walk out the door. She was sitting on that little stool, leaned back against the wall, and the lightning struck and that thunder actually, she said, I felt that in my chest through this wall. You know, it shook the windows. God has that kind of power. But he also, in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, he says to Elijah, he said, I want you to go up on a mountaintop. And he went up there and he saw this violent wind, like a hurricane force wind. And it said God wasn't in the wind. And then there was an earthquake and it shook and crushed the rocks around him. And it said God wasn't in the earthquake. And then he saw fire like a volcano erupt. And he said God wasn't in the fire. But God was in a still, small voice. I guess I need that to understand something about God. That he's not just this giant being up there with his thumb ready to smash human beings. That he hears the quiet prayers of an elderly woman that it's on a fixed income somewhere in her home by herself. That he hears the cries of a parent when their boy is sick or their child is sick, maybe far away in a, in a foreign war somewhere. God understands and hears our concerns and our, our pleas and our cries and the things that we need. Every day he does. What are some of the other attributes of God? You know, the term God is. Have you ever looked that up to see what the Bible says about God is? One of them you know is God is light. In 1 John 1 and verse 5. Let's go there. 1 John 1 and verse 5. 1 John 1 down in verse 5. It says, God... Uh, then this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. What in the world does that mean? You know, I got up this morning, I got cold because the air conditioner was running and it was cold in the house and I got up early and you know how it is before the, before the sun comes up. Well, after about two hours, my feet were about freezing and I, so I opened the back glass, I went outside and walked down our sidewalk towards the sun and I let that sun shine up on me and I tried to look up at the sun and I, you know how you take your hands and you squint and you hold your hands like this but you let the sunlight come between your fingers and you try to look into the sunlight. You can't do it, it's so bright. God is light, and that light is so brilliant and so powerful that it warms your body. The sidewalk is hot where my feet were walking on it to warm my feet. You know, it means that God is, you know, light represents perfection and goodness in the Bible. That's what light means. And, of course, darkness represents sin and evil. In God, there is no darkness. He has no evil within him. He is nothing but good and righteous. He's not up there, you know, plotting and planning against you. He is thinking good thoughts. He is hopeful. He is per perfect in his, in his existence. The other place that it says God is, of course, is 1 John 4 and verse 15. It's amazing that John knew both of these. 1 John 4 and verse 15. 
Whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he is in God. And we have known and believe that God, believe the love that God has to us. God is love. He is love. He's the personification of love. Everything that love, that you can think about that love is, that's what God is. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. I can tell you this, that that is a revelation there in that scripture that most people miss. If they understood the idea that God, even though he may dwell out there somewhere, has the capacity to dwell within human beings. Yes, even these bodies that are, have faults and have sins that are not perfect, he has the ability to dwell in us out of this love that he has. We'll talk about this a little more in a moment. God also dwells in heaven. You know, Jesus said uh, while he was here on this earth to swear. You remember in Matthew, the fifth chapter, when he was giving all these instructions to his disciple, he said, don't swear by heaven because heaven is God's throne. It tells us that. And he prayed, our Father, which art in heaven. That's the dwelling place. You know, the patriarchs used to pray, Father, uh, God, you know, Father, we know that you dwell between the cherubim. I think it was Daniel or maybe Jeremiah that said that. We know that you dwell there between the cherubim. And Paul in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, if you want to turn there, you can. 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, he gave this story in his second letter to the Corinthians about something that happened to him. And he said, I knew a man above 14 years ago, whether he was in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. A man caught up to the third heaven, and we know that there's three heavens, the heavens where the birds fly, the heavens where the stars and the planetary systems exist, and the third heaven where God exists. He said, I was caught up to paradise and heard unspeakable words that's not lawful for and and that really that term there really means inexpressible words not words that he couldn't just turn around and repeat he heard things that he couldn't express in his own language with his own words he couldn't tell you what it was saying what was being expressed to him but John reveals here in this, this passage that we just read a moment ago that God can dwell within an individual. To understand this is a mighty step towards understanding the plan and purpose of God. That he is able to indwell a person. We'll talk about that during the Feast of Tabernacles. Yes, a human being that has flaws, that has a past, that was once a sinful man or a woman, <coughs> excuse me, but could have God's presence within their wretched life. And I use that term not that your life is or my life is wretched. I use that term because Paul called himself, O wretched man that I am. How shall I escape the damnation of you know, eternal destruction? But it is through the love of God and God's forgiveness, of course. Paul described it. And once this happened, the whole world opens up to you. Many things are available. It's like I use this analogy of buying the season pass at some park somewhere. You get all the benefits that come with it. You have access to all the rides and all the shows and all the rooms of God. Once you have God dwelling in you, you have access to all that he is. And we will look at some of these in a moment. In, a moment. in Acts, the first chapter... I want to just read some of these to you. God, Stephen called him the God of glory. Look at some of the aspects of God. The God of glory. I can't describe, I can only read of those encounters of some of those men who are allowed to witness, you know, the presence of God like Paul did and maybe some of those men like Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and others. How they had these visions of the very throne room of God and how it just, they almost felt like they were going to fall over dead because it was so 
powerful and so monumental to them. Paul, in his closing letter, described God as the God of peace. And he called him the God of peace and love on one occasion. In Romans 15, he called him the God of patience and consolation and comfort. And in the same chapter, he calls him the God of hope. And Peter called him the God of all grace. And there, there's a few. You can go look those up if you care to. How does God describe himself? In Isaiah, I want to go back to Isaiah, the 40th chapter. Isaiah 40. Let me see here. 40 verse 12. Isaiah begins to try to describe who God is. And he, he says down in verse 12, Who has measured the water in the hollow of his hands? And meted out the heaven the span, and the and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills and balances. Like he's got the earth, you know, the song goes, he's got the whole world in his hands. That's sort of the imagery here. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or being being been his counselor, who has taught him? With whom took he counsel and who instructed him? and taught him the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket, and are counted as small dust in the balance. Behold, he takes up the aisles as a very small thing. I mean, he just, the earth to him is not even a drop in the bucket. All nations are before him as nothing. Down in verse 21, have you not known, have you not heard, have you not been told from the beginning, have you not understood from the foundation of the earth, and there it is, from the beginning, from the creation, how the earth came about. It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are grasshoppers. Down in verse 23, that brings the princes to nothing. Down in verse 25, to whom then will you liken me? And it's almost as if Isaiah is describing God here, and then God sort of just takes over, and he's, this is like in first person here. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who has created these things? That brings out their hosts by number. He calls them all by name. Talking about the stars. That to me is, I can't even wrap my mind around God able to name all the stars by the greatness of his might. For he is strong in power and not one faileth or is missing. Have you not known, verse 28, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary, and there is no searching of his understanding. And of course, the New Testament tells us that there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't get mad and hold a grudge. God is done, doesn't emotionally react to things that happen to us because yesterday everything was fine and today he's angry with you because you made a mistake and you slipped up. God is, he's on a level, even keel as they say. He's, he doesn't get emotionally upset and then he's angry and then he gets, you know, oh, he wants to come back and apologize to you. He is totally patient with us. Uh, Isaiah 44, just over a page here, verse 21, he says, Remember these, O Jacob and, and Israel, that thou art my servant. I formed you, thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions, and as a cloud your sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O you heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you, you, ever, uh, you lower parts of the earth, break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. The Lord said, thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed you from the womb. I pause here to say I love to go to the nursery at the hospital and if when, you know, when they'll let you get back in, I guess. But and see these newborn babies, and I see people posting pictures of their babies all the time. They're so proud of their new mothers, and they're posting pictures of their little tiny babies. You know, uh, when you think about a child being born, that is a fabulous miracle, isn't it? 
that God gave us. When you look at the hands and the eyes and the feet and the, the smile of a little child, it is, it is a wonderful miracle, and, and I think that we should really consider the one who created all of those things when we think of God. In Psalm 104, uh, maybe we could spend just a little bit of time here. I, I wanted to read the whole chapter, but for lack of time, I'll just read a, a little bit of this. He covers yourself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of his chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks upon the wings of the wind, who makes the, his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire, who laid the foundation of the earth that it shall not be removed forever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. And he's talking about there at creation when the waters were covered the earth and he parted the waters and the, the, dry, the dry land appeared. At thy rebuke they fled and the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. I bet they did, because I know I did. They gave drink to every beast of the field, down in verse 11. He watered the hills from his chambers, verse 14. He caused the grass to grow for the cattle and the herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. All the grains and all the wheat and the barley and the rye that we harvest every year, and much of it we send overseas to help. And that whole chapter there you could go back and read. As I said, I just wanted to touch on a little bit of that. God is eternal. We used to call in the church of God the eternal because that's really what his name means. He's eternal. In Psalm 20 it says, I mean Psalm the 90th chapter he says, you're from everlasting from everlasting to everlasting. And that is a concept we can't understand because we live within the limits of this human body. We're finite. You know, we, we have a beginning and an end. We go to funerals. We see someone, yep, they died. They're no longer here. Their life is ended. Our eyesight is, is limited, and we use terms like start to finish and from this wall to that wall. And as I said, the farthest you can go is such and such, and then you fall off the cliff. That's it. You can't go any farther. The Bible uses this term everlasting and it is associated with words that describe God. I'll just list these for you. You can go back and look them up if you care to. Everlasting love. God has everlasting love. He has an everlasting covenant. He told his Israelites that there would be an everlasting possession for them. There would be an everlasting priesthood. That there was an everlasting statutes that he gave, especially when he was talking about the Day of Atonement and how the priest would go in and offer the sins of the people and make atonement for them, that that was an everlasting statute. He, we sing the song about the everlasting arms, talking about God's protection. His throne will be established of old and is from everlasting to everlasting. His everlasting mercy his everlasting righteousness, his strength, joy, kindness, his name, his light, his, the sign that he gave his people would be an everlasting sign. But it is also for our salvation. He says with everlasting life he will give us. Everlasting life in an everlasting kingdom ruled over by an everlasting king that will have as... Nebuchadnezzar saw in that vision everlasting dominion. These are only a few of the characteristics of God, and I think it is important to know them because it brings hope to each of us to know these characteristics and to know God that he has everlasting mercy. What did Jesus say about his father or our father? Uh, I'll just mention a few of these. He's, you know, as I, I said before, he said, Our father... He called him his father, our father which art in heaven. He told us to call no man our father upon the earth because we have one that is our father, which is in heaven. And uh, in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, he says, There is one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. You know, the word Elohim is a familiar term. It means the family of God. You know, it says in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth and it was 
there that he said, let us make man in our image, that there was someone there with him. In John, the first chapter, it says the word logos was with theos, which in the course of the term theos is God. The, f- the family of God consists of God the Father and Jesus Christ his Son. And we all understand that that will eventually contain or have billions of members, I guess, that you could say that in the family of God at some point in time in the future. Um, Jesus said that all things were delivered unto me of my Father. You know, of course, he came to reveal the Father. That was his, one of his main purposes of being here. And he said, no man has seen God at any time. You, you've neither heard his voice nor seen his shape. If we, ho- if, we never, if we have never seen him nor heard him, and he is in the highest heavens, how can he ever be reached? In John, the ninth chapter, and I'll try to wrap it up here. John 9 and verse 31. John 9 and verse 31. This is uh, the story where God heals the blind man. and, And look at what it says down at the end of that chapter there. Uh, verse 30, we'll pick it up in verse 30. The man answered and said unto him, Why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. We read this here just recently about the blind man that was healed. But look what happens here. Now we know that God hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, him he hears. And does his will, him he hears. This man had a great deal of understanding here, you know, about who God is. God hears those that does His will, that worships God and does His will. I believe that's terribly important. We know that many of the prophecies of the Bible that Jesus Christ, (coughs) excuse me, will inherit the kingdom that is going to be right here on this earth. And for 1,000 years, Jesus Christ is going to reign on this earth with what the Bible calls the first fruits of God. Those that have lived a Christian life, those that have repented and been baptized and have God's Holy Spirit, will be taking a hand in governing and reigning with Christ. What happens next is almost indescribable, and it is read at almost every funeral that I've attended, but most don't understand what it is actually telling us. And I want to go there as we close here to 1 Corinthians 15 chapter. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20, <clears throat> excuse me. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. And as I said, most people don't even understand what that means. They know the Bible is telling us here that Jesus Christ is coming again to gather the first fruits of the harvest, not all of the harvest, but the first fruits, Christ being the first of the first fruits. But look what it says immediately following. Then comes the end when he, speaking of Christ, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God Even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. What happens then? It says he's going to deliver the kingdom to God the Father. I guess that is at some time at the end of his millennial reign. Christ is going to have put down all enemies. He's going to have put down death. And he's going to offer up the kingdom of God to God the Father. And we read about that in Revelation, the 20th chapter, for the final verse here. Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Actually, I got the wrong chapter there. It's Revelation 21. 
Revelation 21, and you, you read Revelation 20, it talks about the binding of Satan, the putting away, and death in the grave are cast into the lake of fire. Immediately following that, chapter 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there is no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of the heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his God, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. A time, we're reading here about a time when God the Father will come down and dwell with his people. A time when he will set up a new headquarters right here on this earth. And in, in a new headquarters where he will govern the universe. It has been in his mind to eventually dwell with his people. And he brought it about out of the greatest act of love by giving us his son and making an atonement for us making recon reconciliation with us and removing the sins from our life and giving us eventually a spiritual body that will be perfect. And in that state, we will be able to see God for the very first time. So when we appear before God, it is good that we at least know some of these things. We should know and understand something about the great God in which we have to do. To recognize his power and his greatness, his enormous strength and profound glory, it should bring us to a place of, as Mr. Armstrong used to say, utter speechlessness. I like the way he put that. We should be totally impressed with his creation. We should be in awe of his position and of authority. And we should be very thankful and grateful for his love, his long-suffering and his mercy and his grace that he shows us every day. And for his everlasting qualities of truth and righteousness, we should never forget. But of all this, his everlasting salvation and eternal life, what a gift. I agree, it's rather difficult to grasp with our limited ability the size and scope of Almighty God. But it is equally difficult to grasp the measure and power of his strength and, and his glory. It is only through his spirit that we are given a small glimpse, as Paul said, I see through a glass darkly, but then face to face.